Hello and welcome. This is the Kubert Community Meeting. Um, today is July 18th, 2018. Um, I'm just starting this and I'll hand it over to Stu when he's there. Um, I would like to start, oh, actually, with my own item. I don't want to be unfriendly, but it's more on the organizational side. So as you saw, there were quite a few design documents um, pushed out to the mailing list about several virtualization and storage related topics including networking, actually. Um, and there, here at the Red Hat, we actually had a big gathering to speak about those designs because they're important to us. Um, we dri drove some of them, and we want to provide our feedback on them back into the design documents. And we actually plan to start working on that. Um, I think everybody in the community will see when, we, um, when we'll do so. Um, so the first follow-up will be to to straighten the design so that there's really something which can be worked on. Okay, and good to see some new faces on this call. Um, welcome, and if you have any questions, um, please step up um, and let us know when, when that is. So I'm done with my item. If there are questions, please raise hands, otherwise I'd give it over to Stu. All right. Well, thank you, Fabian. Uh, sorry about that, gentlemen, ladies. Um, computer crash right as the meeting started, as usual. Uh, <laughs> next topic on the agenda is Scott, if you're here, website revamp, sir. Any comments? Yeah, sure. Um, I haven't shared my desktop using uh, Zoom before, but maybe I can try. Is that okay? You don't need to try. It will just work. <laughs> All right, here we go. Uh, get Qbert. Can anybody see my screen? As expected. Yes. Excellent. So, okay. Um, the website has had a redesign here recently, and I just wanted to share with everybody the current website as it stands today. You just might move that over just a little bit. So this is... Uh, got the old logo and the old kind of uh, structure that we had. Um, many of the things kind of transfer over to the new website just with the new look and feel, like how to get Kubevert on Minikube and also test it out on an existing cluster. And we had this blog page, which uh, nested everything in there. And we've had great contributions from the community on that. Let's keep that going. And then um, resources page, which had videos, and then you'll also notice like in the footer where we had all of our social media information as well as how to participate in the community to some extent. And then the GDPR privacy stuff was kind of pasted over here on the end. So without further ado, the new website has a new logo up here on the top left for Kubevert, which looks really good. And then you'll just see basically like a, a nice visual kind of aesthetic overhaul of the entire website. So right now we have basically these two ways to try Kubernetes. Um, one of the things that I did just want to want to let out of the box really quickly is that we are working on two more buttons and we're going to have a try Kubevert on GCP and a try Kubevert on uh, AWS. Uh, the only thing that's blocking that from being released right now is basically making sure that all of the AMIs that we create are um, verified through CI and CD. So that, that's in process now, and uh, uh, you should see those up here shortly, hopefully. And then through the rest of the home page, we have a nice overview of what Kubert is and some really um, good looking icons on the web page. And then also the footer has been updated as well. And you can still get to our Twitter account, GitHub, um, the Google group email address, and also the calendar. So then going up to the next page, we've organized the videos over here um, for the videos that we have so far in a couple of ASCII cinema uh, presentations here. And we're also, you, you also tag these objects so that they can be organized over on the left-hand navigation screen. And the next thing that we have are the docs. I'm not exactly sure how this is gonna end up, but right now it basically redirects to uh, the old website's user guide. But I think that we do want to keep all of the documentation embedded into this current kind of uh, framework here. So uh, we're still working on that, but it's making some progress. 
And then last but not least is the community page. We wanna make sure that it's really easy for people to get involved in this. So we have a quick way to star the project, to fork the project through GitHub, follow us on Twitter, and then join the mailing list. And let me see, I think that's pretty much it for right now. Um, please go out and take a look at the PR and provide any feedback to the website that you think uh, needs to be implemented and we'd be happy to take a look at it. And I think that does it. Awesome, thank you. Um, and thank you for the reference to continuous integration because that's a segue into the next topic uh, from Roman. Actually, actually sorry, go on. I, I just want to say um, thank you for the revamp. I think it's a step forward. There were some small glitches to me that acceptable. I don't see it as a blocking item. I think I would be love to fight the issues. And others, please provide your feedback. Um, if you have flames, take care to not burn your computer. You won't burn the internet. No, please provide feedback so that we can move forward with that. I think for me, let's see that we can move it, uh, merge it rather sooner than later. Thanks. Hey Scott, I was wondering, did you consider using Patternfly for the website? Well, um, the UXD team here did a lot of work on this and they have a lot of experience in the Patternfly space as well. But initially when we were taking a look at this and trying to get some feedback on what framework to host it on, we settled basically on GitHub and Jekyll because of the, uh, I suppose, the workflow that's required to post new blog posts. Um, and that's just kind of where we ended up. I don't, I'm not opposed to any other framework um, for sure. So, I, I'm, I'm, I, I mostly mean the styling versus how you run it, right? Just mostly about the CSS, you know, thinking about the fact that the UI of Kubert will be pattern fly. You know. For yeah, example, the colors that, that we use is not necessarily the same colors we have that we'll end up having. So. Yeah, I just I just wanted to say from a design point of view, um, uh, being on the UX team, I know that we discussed, um, you know, the end user of the website, and I think that we tried to make sure it had more of a consumer look and feel, whereas Patternfly is is really more about uh, more of an enterprise admin uh, type look and feel. So we wanted to make sure we differentiated the community website from from that and that's why they're different and why we didn't consider using pen and fly. Why do you care though? I mean, why is that a advantage to separate two? Um, I think, you know, the, the information that we present on the website is very different from the information that we uh, design in our enterprise applications that our users use. You know, we want to make it very clear, large buttons, bright colors, uh, something that a user is going to, um, other than the blog, you know, probably just to get started and figure out what this thing is about. So it's really more informational, whereas our enterprise applications are uh, UIs that our users are going to be using every day um, and, you know, a lot more dense content. And so there are definitely big differences in use cases. And that's, that's really why I think the designs are, are so, are so different. And if you look at a lot of other community websites, you know, think about overt versus, you know, overt.org versus, um, you know, the overt admin portal, I think, um, you know, there's, there's a very strong alignment between a lot of the other communities out there and their admin uh, UI tools. So, yeah, I think that's from historical reasons, not so much a conscious decision. Um, but I'm, I'm okay. I I know for the for example, the Foreman community, we actually decided to make the community website look similar to the product or project. Um, yeah. Just wondering if there was, you know, your yeah, yeah. are fine. Just I was just curious. Yeah, and it's not to say that Patternfly couldn't eventually have uh, a design that is recommended for uh, community websites, something like that, um, that's more uh, consumer facing. Thank you. Uh, so next topic, uh, Roman, uh, as far as the CI. Uh, yeah, so. So far, we were using for OCI some internal servers from Red Hat, and we have a kind of a soft deadline, which is at the end of this month, 
and kind of a hard deadline, which is the end of August, where we have to move off of those which are of this service. And we're currently in a transition phase over to probably right now uh, standard CI, which already is also using where they, and they have a lot of resources from the hardware perspective, and we may be able to use that. Uh, yeah. Might still not mean that we can't use Pro in front of that. So we're also working on still investing more into Pro. And yeah, that's the short term solution at least. We will see where all that goes. Can't say much more. We'll try to keep the CI service up as much as possible since it's very vital for us. Thank you, Roman. Very vital, which is why I got the uh, uh, high position in the conversation here. Um, next up, we have the VM name uh, limitations that Yanir has been working on. Yeah, hi. So basically, it's more the, of an open question because uh, it started quite a discussion about it in the issue in the notes. Uh, limitation started from we from use of identifiers. I mean labels uh, using the VM names, which opened that issue uh, from the starters. But uh, then we started discussing about if we really do want to limit uh, the VM name uh, according some thoughts or about limiting to DNS labels conventions. Uh, in VMware, for example, so they have two fields which use one computer name with 63 chars and one VM name with 128 uh, characters, uh, which we need to take under consideration if we import VMs <laughs> to our uh, environment. Uh, you can either weigh in your <laughs> thoughts here or add it to the issue itself so we can converge to uh, one decision. Uh, another thought uh, that was uh, uh, can mentioned. I, can yeah. I add something here? Sure. Um, I don't see a reason to limit the VM name since also VMware seems to differentiate between the actual host name and the VM name. And I can, I mean, I see uh, we should just allow as long as names as pods allow names. And we're sanitizing them anyway. And we also have a host name field where when you import for VMware, you can set the VM name or yeah. host name, which so, VMware has. I, I kind of disagree with that. Um, and the reason I put some notes in uh, on the GitHub page. So <clears throat> the reason being is if the, if the VM name by default ends up being the host name, then we're letting you put an invalid host name, right? Um, we're sanitizing it also right now. So, which brings me to my next, <laughs> my next thing, right? So the, the sanitizing it, um, I'm not sure that's necessarily, is that really such a great idea as well? Because the, the reason that that bothers me is if you, if you specify and you say, I want, you know, the name 63 characters plus five, right? And you sanitize it by truncating the last five characters. That's not really a declarative system anymore, right? You're now, you're, you're getting something, but it's not really what you asked for. Um, the other thing that's a little bit... Um, At least it's what the pod does too. So when you enter a pod, you will see this host name truncated, by the way. Okay. Yeah. Well, but, I mean, if you want to behave exactly like the pod, I guess that, that makes sense. Um, I mean, the, the Kubernetes documentation does point out that while they use 253 characters as the limit for for most resources, it's not a hard rule. Some are less. Right? Yeah. Um, but, okay. Well, yeah, we can limit it to two sides. I, I don't <laughs> mind too much. Um, I just thought it's fine if we take the same approach like we yeah. have the pod. By the way, they didn't limit in the past, but then on some platforms, the pods crashed or because <laughs> the names are too long for the host name. So yeah. they limited it to 63 then. I, I was just wondering if, um, and maybe this is wrong, but I was just wondering if maybe from a um, code simplicity and an understanding perspective of what's going on and all the inner workings, if it was easier to just go ahead and enforce a limit and, and reject it with the verification hook at the beginning. Um, just in terms of a simplification of the system, um, if nothing else, it, it kind of felt like a good idea to me, but 
I definitely understand, you know, the, the counterpoints and everything else it makes a lot of sense too. So it's, it's, it's kind of tough. It's, a, I, mean, I guess we can just limit it. If no one complains, we can keep it short and then it's easier to understand. I agree with that. Well, I have a concern with that, of course. And that is, <laughs> <laughs> um, because of what Kubert's mission is, which is to provide kind of this transition from uh, previous virtual machine um, solutions to a containerized environment, uh, we do need, of course, unfortunately, to support a superset of, um, of all solutions out there. So as long as we pick a limit that's large enough to accommodate reasonably expected names coming from, say, VMware or other uh, platforms, then not as big an issue, but. Yeah, I, I would just add that DNS is 255 characters and many people put their DNS as their VM names. So I would vote to have more than 64 characters if possible. Yeah, so just because we don't have enough opinions, here's mine. Um, I'm strongly in favor of respecting the limits, especially for the name. So for really the entity name and for the, um, so for the, for the DNS relevant name to obey the limits of Kubernetes. Um, for consistency with Kubernetes. The thing is um, that we know that for people, um, a longer name is often required, I mean, which is exceeding the 36 characters. So there I wonder if we can take the approach like the identifier, which is the name currently, is, is equi equivalent to, to what Kubernetes says for pod identifiers. Um, and that we have a separate field for representing a, a more human readable title. OpenShift is doing the same. They have the identifier and they have a display type name for, for an entity. And that is, I add, for example, for templates. So to split that. For the title, and maybe it makes sense to, for the title, for the title that it would also be an annotation. So we even don't have the limits of the labels, for example, but it's an impurity descriptive. What we could also enforce is with an admission controller is uniqueness because one thing is the length and the descriptiveness, but let's look at the features, what the name identifiers give to us. I mean, specifically the, the identifier of the entity, the name allows us to query for it, to, to address it. I think that's important. That's why I want to limit, uh, consume the limits of Kubernetes or respect it. But for the, for the title, I would really like to be more in favor of what virtualization systems expect, that you have really long descriptive titles. Um, but you couldn't use it, for example, for querying without the right tools. I mean, you could look it up and then infer the name from, from a very long title. That's possible. One thing for the title I'm unsure about is if we want to make it unique as well. So we could enforce uniqueness with an admission control, for example. So we could have, it's hard to put it into plain words. So I think what I'm trying to say is, I'd like to keep the name as an identifier of the entity and obey all the Kubernetes limits and restrictions, whatever they are, and have a separate field, which is more friendly to how it's done, like in enterprise management systems, like over it, we can have a free form identifier or in, I'm not, not sure about OpenStack, but VMware vSphere, vSphere, where you can have longer names. And I would enforce a uniqueness on that title as well. So what I see in OpenShift is a lot is using an annotation for that purpose. Oh yes, that's what I was saying. The title or the, you know, that descriptive title should be an annotation okay. because then we don't have the restrictions on the length. It can be pretty long. You had uh, expressed a concern that the name would not be unique or that we needed to enforce it to be unique, but I think that's actually already true because it's where are we not using the resource name as the VM name? I'm not speaking about what it is today. I'm speaking about where we want to go. And if we use an annotation, then there's no enforcement then it's, that it's unique across objects. But we could, we could try to enforce uniqueness. And I think that's important because if we have like a de facto identifier, but which is not really the identifier, then we still want to enforce uniqueness. So that is how I would at least structurally solve it. Identifiers, identifiers in Kubernetes, and then more for, 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 for more freedom, we could have these annotation-based identifier, which we just guarantee uniqueness, but not addressability of the entity. Yes. So that, my, that, okay. 
I, I just want to say that makes sense if we ever go to multi-interface and each interface will have a canonical name that actually solves that problem as well. So to avoid having multiple names or C names attached or something like that that is typical in virtualization. So I would support that. So just, just to sum it up, currently what we do have is the name, which is limited. Uh, actually, the DNS label limitation in Kubernetes is 63 characters. And we also have an annotation for UID. So if I'm getting what you guys say is adding another annotation for the user display name uh, for the VM, keeping the name title as an identifier as we do right now, and also keeping the UID annotations for special, uh, for unique uh, identification. Well, I think regarding the DNS stuff, that's not really relevant to what we discussed right now. <laughs> so you don't have to solve it here right now in context yeah. of this. But it's I, irrelevant in general. Yeah. I think what we need to do is first, why do we have the UID label or annotation is it as a label i could imagine for query they're just i guess you're talking about the uid label on the part not on the VM. Yeah, that's not related either yeah okay that's good because that was my impression and then the name should just be the name of the entity we should not we should not have another field which is representing the same information like i know today we have kubert slash vm dash name which is refer have it has the same information as the name entity itself I actually wonder if that is needed by the system or if it's just added for convenience. I'm not sure about that. In the end, to me, Yanir, to answer your question, we have the, the entity name where we enforce the limits as, as Kubernetes does. We would add a new annotation for um, a friendly name. I think OS release is calling a friendly name. And these are the two relevant fields. And everything else is... Oh, Fabian, now I know what you mean. We have this VM dash a name label in our examples because when you create it, we, because when you create them that you can do something like RIPCTL expose so that they have a unique name label. It's not really, it's not useful in any case. It's just so that when you create the examples, you don't run into service yeah. mac mix. It is nothing to do with the system per se. Could okay. have been something completely arbitrary different. I see your point. I actually wonder how Kubernetes does it. Do do deployments create these kind of labels on pods to Oh no no, we really just have them so that you you know, a service with load balance. Oh, if they yes, have the same yes. labels, you would have load balancing. Yeah, it's, yes, yes. I, I understand why why we need the labels to to select the entities. I just wonder how I just wonder if we need if we should do that automatically that way around. Ah, okay. I don't know how pods are doing it, actually. But that's okay, it's good to know that it's not mandatory. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. We knew that would be a lively discussion, but if your uh, thoughts have not been properly represented, please feel free to also add comments to the issue that is in the document. Moving on to the next topic, we have Kubernetes 1.11 uh, status. Uh, Mark? Uh, yes, just recently Kubernetes 1.11 was released and we already have the first issue that Kubernetes does not work on uh, that version. So I'm busy with adding this to our CI so that we can reproduce the issue and work on it. Um, and then I will directly pick up the next topic that is the Kubernetes operator. Um, this is for getting a better lifecycle management for Kubernetes. So um, we are using the operator framework for it which will make it easier to install and enable it to upgrade uh, Kubernetes. And uh, yeah, we just started uh, with it together with uh, Michael. And uh, yeah, it's work in progress and looking forward to see it working soonish. That's it. Awesome, thank you. <clears throat> Next up, we have OpenShift origin device plugins. Uh, this is more of kind of a, uh, just a public service announcement. Earlier this week, there was a issue filed that device plugins were just simply not working with uh, an OpenShift origin cluster. Uh, this was uh, running on CentOS on bare metal um, using the OC cluster up command. After doing some diagnostics, it was pretty much determined that the issue is that inside the origin container, uh, the host path for the device plugins directory, varlib, kubelet device plugins was not bind mounted to the host. 
So inside of the container, uh, Kubernetes was running properly and was creating its device manager socket, but it was not exposed to the cluster at large, and so nothing else was able to consume that. So just a heads up if you're running into that, and that is with Kubernetes 1.10, which we're supposed to be supporting, or OpenShift 3.10. Um, so, you know, uh, I know that uh, Minikube does not work because it's running 3.9, uh, or Minishift, excuse me, is 3.9. And so that's just simply not a supported version at this time. But even with uh, 3.10, we're running into this. Uh, I believe an upstream bug has been filed, but I don't have that issue off the top of my head. Next up, we have Dockerized Kubevert with SE Linux. Archim? Uh, so I started to look on, uh, on the issue, and uh, I already have some problems with it. Uh, in the, yeah. In general, we can just uh, again we can just uh, run our Dockerized without uh, uh, without SE Linux, like uh, to to set security uh, security options to label disable, and I hope it will work. And uh, I don't really see a reason to run it under C Linux, so maybe I will just uh, go on this solution. Like I don't see the reason to run our Dockerized. Uh, container under C Linux, so uh, that's pretty old. Thank you, Sebastian. You've been working on uh, vert control lately. Yes. So uh, about uh, the vert control, it's now on the review. Uh, you can, I uh, just working on the, uh, no, it's not a start stop, it's uh, about the uh, console. So the console will wait until uh, until the virtual machine is ready and up. And also about the virt expose to change the uh, target port to be a, a string and not an int. Both of them are in a, in a review right now, and uh, that's it. Thank you. And Ihar, networking API. Yeah. <clears throat> so the previous week, I uh, I wasn't in, on the on the gathering that everyone was at. Uh, so I looked uh, in the meantime. I looked through the. Uh, through our networking API right up and uh, to see what was missing in the current API implementation. So there were some small things, so I figured I could tackle those. Uh, so one thing is uh, like uh, a field that can tell you that uh, the, v the VMI is supposed to be completely disconnected from the external world. Uh, so the support for this field is already up for review. I think it's pretty much there. There is a small adjustment needed, but uh, but anyway, if you, if you if you want something to review, you can, you can pick at that. Uh, the next thing that was missing is delegate IP uh, support uh, for the bridge um, uh, interface type. Um, so. Once I like started implementing that, uh, uh, I feel well. First, I figured out that uh, I, at least me, and it seems like other people may also have this. Um, I don't f actually fully understand what's like the semantics should be for this field, for at least for the pod interface case. So that should should be clarified. Um, and uh, I don't know, like. I don't think we should discuss that right now. I should probably talk to Fabian in person on that matter. But um, yes, clearly semantics is not like well defined anywhere in the write up, and uh, um, at least not in my mind either. But anyway, I, my plan for 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 this PR is to split it into yeah, sorry, to split it into two pieces, and one will be like a pure API, like APIs piece, which will just add support for the field in general, 
and then we can discuss what we do with the port uh, interfaces uh, for this specific case uh, separately. So this is like progressing. The, the current PR is work in progress, uh, but uh, I'm going to split it today and then it should be ready for review, at least the first piece. And we can follow up with the discussion. And then the third part, which is uh, more complex is, uh, as you may have recalled, uh, we've added support for custom MAC address for inter per interface uh, like a week or two ago. And it works fine for Kubernetes, but not for OpenShift SDN, as it turns out. And the reason is because the OpenShift SDN is kind of uh, restrictive. Uh, it has uh, specific uh, open flow rules that block the traffic that that comes from, from the pod with the Aaron MAC address. So we gotta figure, it out, figure out what to do with that. I've sent an email to, to the mailing list with the option, what we could do. Um, and uh, I don't know like whether we, it doesn't seem like we have a clear, clear answer to at, le at least what's the path which we want to take uh, one of the paths is just uh, try to patch the OpenFlow rules specifically for OpenShift SDN and try to make it so that it kind of works at least for this particular case. Uh, since for Flannel we don't need to do anything, but for this SDN we, we may need to. But then it doesn't resolve the general issue of, well, we are not really completely isolated from the underlying SDN because we exposed the custom MAC address to outside world. And so we could, we could instead of trying to, to adopt to each specific SDN that may have the same issue, we may alternatively uh, think about how we can completely isolate this custom MAC address that is exposed to the guest, but isolated from the external world, meaning having something, some router or whatever in, inside the, the pod that would hide this MAC address, custom MAC address from, from the outside world, which obviously like is a more complex solution in terms of, you know, all the wiring and uh, performance wise, I guess. Uh, so that's something not to take uh, easily. There were also uh, other ideas flying, like maybe we shouldn't support custom MAC addresses for, for the pod interface uh that's all great but first well it already works for kubernetes so why not have it and also um you know you you may still have the same issues with the device plugins like your your underlying device plugin implementation may also have something that that will not be compatible with the custom MAC address so it doesn't really solve the issue so there's that issue and uh it would be nice to have some kind of clarification discussion on the mailing list, wherever to like, at least what's the, what are the paths that we may want to consider? Because it seems like this problem hits the philosophical grounds of the Kubvirt, which like the claim was done that uh, Kubvirt is like, makes everything completely compatible with and transparent to underlying Kubernetes. But with custom MAC address, the current implementation it's not transparent. It's not. It's not hidden. It's 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 exposed, and it it already introduced an incompatibility issue with OpenShift, and probably we may we may experience the same performance. So what do we do with that? Do we complicate the in-pod networking setup to to hide the MAC address, or I don't know something to to think about? So I, I guess oh, fifteen minutes. No, Roman, please go. Okay, just one third thing. I guess it's not so much even about OpenShift or Kubernetes. It's probably more about the network provider, right? So I think OpenShift uses OVN right, right now, or OVS. And in theory, you could also use that on Kubernetes. So we're uh, not it there. Yeah, I definitely like mm -hmm. it, it. It is not directly related to OpenShift. It's just the the way the OpenShift is usually mm -hmm. bundled uh, gives us this. Kind of... 
Yeah. We cannot just drop the SDN and like say like use something else. We don't even want to do it for any other SDN anyway. So, so my take is this is specifically a problem which is most visible on the pod network, and here uh, I think we must stay compatible also to make our lives easier. So my take is here. We have control over what ports we want to expose to the network, and everything else is not our under our control on the pod network. And I think I would treat it that way. So that what does it mean? I would say if we cannot define what MAC address to use on an on a given network, the pod network, then we cannot support it. And because that's also true for the IP address, I mean we can also not define the IP addresses. That is why we inherit it. So what I'm trying to say is to me it's um, to me, this is a good seed generic, but pod network is the only case. There could be networks where you don't have control of the MAC address and where you don't have control of the IP address, and we need to recognize that. For the pod network, we know we cannot control the IP, we cannot control the MAC, thus we obey those rules. Full stop. I think that's the case for, um, for pod networks. We only have control over what we want to expose on layer four, so UDP, TCP services. However, for device plugins, they give us the full freedom. There could be device plugins which allow us to set the MAC address, like the L2 Bridge plugin, which um, Yuval and Peter are working on. But there could be other plugins, like a, like a CNI plugin, where we have the same restrictions as for the pod network. So what does this mean? I think we need some kind of metadata for the networks in order to understand what functionality they provide. The most easy one is to understand, is it layer two or layer three connectivity they provide? Do we, is there an IP address we have to respect? Or is there, or can we choose the IP freely? That is the kind of metadata we need to express per device plugin, which is a property of the device plugin. And then we can make the decisions on the higher levels. Does that make sense? Um, I don't know, I'm not sure, like, maybe I missed, Instant, like with the, the device plugins approach and like what we're going to support there. But I think we may still have similar issues there. Like some, some devices, some device plugins don't really support what uh, the custom MAC addresses or whatever we want. Yeah. And the idea behind the custom MAC address, as far as I understand, was that it's a front end property. And so it should not necessarily be related to the underlying network type. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, and the use case behind the custom MAC address, as far as I understand, is that you may have some weird VNF or whatever that may have some expectations about the MAC address that is exposed to it, but it may not necessarily care about what happens after with the traffic after it leaves the VM, as long as it's properly routed and maybe. It, on, on the on the root path, you know, basically the MAC address changes or whatever. It doesn't care. But if this is not the use case, uh, and we can just say, you know, sometimes you, you cannot override the MAC address, then I'm not sure why we, we, we were looking at that in the first place. Huh, what, if, what it's, if, 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 if it's if it's not like a general feature. I think it's still a strong use case for the simple, the simple non-Kubernetes case, right? So for the L2 bridge plugin, I think there it's relevant because there you can bridge your VM into the local network, and there it makes sense to be able to specify a MAC address because you want to, you want to set up your DHCP server to provide the right you know configuration to the client. So I think that is a valid use case. But you're right for SROV, that's the opposite. I mean that's a very strict physical case where. You, eventually cannot control it. And the other side is the pod network where the MAC address is given. So we're a little bit sitting in between two chairs, but I think it's still a valid use case. I would keep it because it's still relevant for, for quite a range of use cases, I think. Even with SRV and pod network, I agree that we can't use it. But what's your suggestion? Just block the, the field for the pod network? I wouldn't block it, I would raise an error. If we see that the network is not, I mean, in general, I would do a check. Do we know that the network is supporting the MAC address? Then we allow it. If it's not supporting it, then we raise an error. I think we have that similar with other stuff in pods, like for example, if we have 
setting a UID, I think a specific UID, which the user is not allowed to set, then it will raise an error if the pod is launched. Okay. And okay. yeah, it's uh, maybe I'm, I'm not sh entirely sure why we just like just completely uh, disregard any technical solutions for for that that may be there. Sorry, I don't understand that. Well, in theory, you could you you could make it so that both your guest has access to, like, is exposed to a custom MAC address, but at the same time, this MAC address doesn't leak into the external world, and so the compatibility is kept for any SDN there. Yeah, I, I tell you why. Because because maybe you want that guest to have that specific MAC address um, because you intended to. And I think in the environments where we don't have control, we should just match what the environment provides with respect that. I mean, that's the same with DHCP, right? I mean, you. If you know that the environment provides DHCP, then you don't want to configure your own IP address because you can risk collisions on the network or you don't have connectivity at all. So I think in cases that we cannot the MAC address, that we cannot control the MAC address, then we don't want to override it because we assume that the environment has an intent why it's giving us that MAC address. That would be my reasoning. And actually, I think it's it's true. I mean, if we think about spoofing filters and that kind of stuff, there's the reason to do it. And yeah, it doesn't make sense to set it if the MAC address doesn't get out of the setup anyway. So, but I, I see your point. Maybe we want to make it <laughs> configurable over time, but I wouldn't make it configurable right now. So, so Is MAC address true? One, one of the use cases was that that internally, the MAC address has to be set to something that was a use case. So if you hide it from the outside, it's completely perfect. But an application running on the VM that requires a specific MAC address would still work. Yeah. So for the, I, the only use case is that I see a VM is getting bridged to a, to a network, and then it makes sense if we can specify it. It does make sense to specify it if we get it, like in the pod network and in the SRLV case. So to me, right now, I'll really make it depending on the network. We'll have that with other features as well. Like, you know, can can you set a specific model? Because with, uh, if you use um, if you host user, you have to use Vert.io, for example. So there will be dependencies between the front end configuration and the back end configuration. And just this is just one example. Could be, though, you know, the 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 less the you have surprises and special cases, the better. So, but as you wish, we can look at that instead. All right, next topic: networking again. Uh, Yuval with L two networking and Peter. Okay. Uh, so, uh, what we're working on, on on both sides of the one solution, and this is to provide L2 networking. One end is the device plugin that exposes um, can expose a bridge into the pod uh, according to some configuration, and then on the other, on the other hand, uh, adding a new kind of uh, network that is called a resource, which of translates to a device plugin uh, with a network name. Uh, we have a small API that we kind of crafted between the two, those two things. And this is based on an environment variable that is, has some JSON encoded information in it. And from Kubevit perspective, any, any, uh, any time it has a network of type uh, resource, then it assumes that this resource should exist with all the implications of scheduling and, and everything that comes with it. And then to also assume that the information about what the actual resource did uh, is encoded in this environment variable. And on the other hand, we have a specific implementation that assumes uh, exposing a bridge from um, the host into this kind of conforming into a pod conforming to this environment variable that Qubit can use. Uh, in the future, we may add different device plugins, more complex that can do whatever, as long as they are defined as device plugins, which mean resources, 
and it's and expose information via the API that we've uh, designed. Here. Okay. And that's it. Ah, we just wait for questions. Guess there are none. Um, Peter, uh, have comments on uh, the Uber hooks? Yeah, sure. So the PR with initial hook support was merged and it's ready to use. There is just single hook point uh, on defined domain that's called after we build the domain XML. Uh, the user can use a hook to change this domain XML or add something to it. And basically for those who don't know, the, the hook is deployed as a sidecar. It can take attributes from the VM annotations or from the whole VM object. And in this case, it can it obtains the generate the dom domain XML and can change it and send it back. So right now, if someone wants to implement uh, this kind of hook sidecar, they must implement the whole server uh, and uh, so socket handling and all of it. But we want to introduce a simple framework to, um, to get all of this out and uh, let the user just implement the function that takes whatever is passed from Kubert, change it and send it back. And yeah, that's it. If you want to take a look at how a hook, a hook sidecar looks like, it's merged into the Kubert also with an example. And I can send a link to the chat here. That's it. Thank you. Next up, we have CPU pinning. Was this Archim, the Issue uh, it's mine. Yeah. Yes, please, Pedro. Yes, please. Please add the link to the agenda with the example. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't add my name to it. Um, yeah. So CPU pinning. Um, the um, the latest version of Kubernetes uh, provides a, a CPU manager. It's a very simple. Has a very simple functionality. It uh, basically. Um, provides dedicated uh, CPUs uh, to a pod and then pins, uh, pin to those uh, CPUs. I want to leverage this and uh, pin um, the VM CPU, the VM uh, vCPUs to those um, already pinned CPUs in the pod. Uh, there are some challenges with this, um, but yeah, I'm just starting. Um, starting to work on this. Hopefully for the next week, we'll have something already written. Cool, thank you. Is that Kubernetes uh, zero? What version of Kubernetes supports that? It's, it's 1.10. Um, okay. 110, and this is really a beta um, that, they are, that they are introducing now. Awesome, thank you. Sure. All right, any other topics for the agenda and notes portion of this discussion? Fair enough, moving on to the open floor. Um, couple notes, first up is call for proposals. Uh, OpenStack Summit, if you were hoping to submit a proposal, I believe it is now too late that the window closed a couple hours ago. There is still time for KubeCon North America. I looked it up yesterday, it was early August, but I don't have the exact date. I will fix that in the notes here, but please feel free, submit a topic. We, uh, the more the merrier. And next up, Kubert client Python, two customers. Was this uh, your? Hello, Lucas. Uh, I just wanted to bring some attention about this repository because um, uh, I don't know if everybody's familiar with it, but uh, this repository is also generated from open API specification uh, from the Kubert. And um, it's supposed to provide the, the SDK, the Python SDK to, you know, the access to the Kubert API. Uh, so far, we got the two customers there. Uh, one is the, or well, users. <laughs> yeah, one is the Virdu Who project, and second one is the Kubert Ansible modules. And um, there, there are some issues which I would like to bring up. Um, one is about the testing, because every time when this uh, client gets regenerated, we need to test it somehow. And the question is, uh, if we want to test it on the site, on the Kubert side, or on the, on the client Python repository side, 
because as I said, this code is auto-generated, so it's actually uh, being generated on the site uh, inside of the kubevirt Kube repository, and then it's being directly pushed inside of the uh, client Python. So there is no uh, space to do a review or some kind of gating. It will just land it there, and then we might to see if it failed or not. So this is one question which I would like to bring up on what side we should test it. Second thing is uh, versioning, because uh, since we already have several branches, like, uh, you know, release 0 0.4 and 0 0.6 and uh, master, uh, there are some incompatible, incompatible things like this uh, when we were factoring from the offline VMs to uh, VM instances and this stuff. So we will probably have to create the branches also inside of the client Python to, to reflect this, these things. And, and that's probably it. Um, so I'm open to suggestions. So I guess uh, regarding to testing, I mean, the pro would be if we do it in the core repo that we immediately get the feedback that something isn't right, or at least for the parts we test. Uh, contra might be that there might not be an issue which we can't easily solve and which will block progress for some time on master, I guess. So you can tell there. Well, we, we, we could have a separate um, project which is just designed around creating the client uh, so that it isn't necessarily part of core repo, but it happens before we actually do the automated uh, deployment of the, the client. Sorry, I, I don't understand how you exactly want to do that. Oh, well, like how we have a GitHub repo for Qbert. We have one for client Python. What if we have one for client Python testing, which is part of the CI, and you literally just have a dedicated project within GitHub that is for running the, the automated tests and actually doing the automated deployment then? I'm not sure <laughs> a lot of repos there. I, I, I think it's an advantage actually that we are, but that we can still focus so much on just a single point of truth in the core repo of Kubert Kubert. And I mean, it would be beneficial to test it immediately and fix it immediately. Maybe we can, maybe we can switch to open to completely use the open API gen from upstream Kubernetes and then as part of that, start testing and see how well it goes. If we see that we're blocked, then we can't merge anything anymore because the Python generator always fails or something, then we need another solution. But I mean, if we manage to make it work, I think it's the best option to test it in an extra lane, maybe on every commit or for the rest. Well, that's fair. I mean, if, it, if the, um, likelihood of it ever failing is low because it's auto-generated, then it really shouldn't cause an impact, but we don't know that, so. Still, we might, um, still, I mean, another question which follows up then is regarding to backward compatibility, although we're not switching the API version. I guess that's something, to, I mean, you use a Kubernetes, a generated client for, I don't know, Kubert 0 0.80, and then we release 0 0.8.1, then it should, in theory, still be possible to use that client, the, the, which has serious the minor number. Uh, I'm not sure if that's something which we need to test and fix right now, but it's definitely something which we would need when, once we come close to 1.0, since we then need to, to ensure backward compatibility from the API level. But then I think it's a requirement anyway right now, not so much. Thoughts on that? OK. Um, and the second thing with the versioning, um, um, I don't really have uh, experience with this, how to do that. Uh, because not every, you know, you know when, when some pull request lands in the, in the complete repository, it doesn't necessarily mean that it will actually generate a new version of the SDK because, you know, if there is no API change involved, uh, 
there is no need to regenerate the SDK. So the question is how we will actually do some kind of versioning uh, of these uh, of these things because I have a issue on the on the this repository from Piotr that he wants to uh, have some tagging for the significant <laughs> API changes and, and I don't know how to do. So uh, I, I, would, I, I would say if if the API doesn't change, we don't push a commit. That's right. But still, we see that a tag is created, and I would just tag the same commit then multiple times. Yeah, I would actually not ever uh, push a client unless there was a release tag anyway, and then you only have release versions of the, the client. Well, at least for master, that's not sufficient, or at least for branches, not. So you can't try out it otherwise if something changes. Uh, what we would probably need is uh, an extra suffix or something then to I mean, you add, yeah, what's different questions then how would we fix the client? If it looks like it worked for the release, then we see there's an issue, we fix it. So we have, well, no, then it's just part of the next release. Then we would do an emergency release. That's why we have everything automated so that we can do bug fix releases and they would propagate through to the client. And then we would have uh, would ask people to update to the newest client version of that major version, basically. Mm -hmm. And the tagging is going to be only on the Kubernetes releases, right? Like, I would I would expect that Travis then also tags with the same tag, the client, right now at least. Um, what I can also say here is that at the beginning, they did, they did the two on client Go from Kubernetes SDK. They're not generated one, the Go SDK. They ditched that. And they're now doing their own releases there in a, in a more asynchronous way so that it's easier for them to, to bring in fixes. What I just wonder is if we need to do it here too, because it's almost completely out, because it is auto generated completely. That's not the case for client code. I would suggest that we at least start that way. And maybe we then see that we have to do independent versioning for some unexpected reasons. It, it can happen to us. I wouldn't say that it will happen to us here because we really generate it mostly. Okay, uh, so I will go these directions and and also the third thing is that I really will have to generate also the client for these uh, extra branches that are released 0 to 4 and 0 to 4 to 6 because they are not compatible the client. So we would probably have in Travis check if on which branch we are and if it's tagged and then we see okay it's a tag for branch whatever then we do push it also the same name on the branch with the same name on client and take it to. Yes, yes, I, I think this is this is uh, this is straightforward. I don't have a problem with this. Uh, okay, good, thanks. Cool. Well, we're uh, over time, so we're going to go ahead and skip Fabian. Just kidding. Uh, Libvirt testing. Did you have some notes there, sir? Um, yes, I would actually love. I will see that I engage them to join this meeting as well, some Libvirt guys, because we <laughs> using their software somewhat. Uh, just a heads up, I've been discussing with them a little bit of list. Um, because there was this Fedora 28 rebase, and I'm seeing that is going forward quite nicely. I've been uh, engaging with the Libvirt community. And um, sorry, let me start different. We want to consume Libvirt. And specifically, they still work on features for us. So they want to slim down Libvirt to be more suited for our use case. They want to get a little bit ready of some craft, which will help us to get the image size down, introduce the attack surface. But the more, they also look for better lead patterns. And with Virtual D, they're also doing something to allow us to consume stuff like profiles, which will help us to. It doesn't matter. At least features for us. And thus, I think to us, it would be interesting to start to be able to consume Libvirt on a regular cadence and consume it. But in order to do so, and to, in order to do so, we want to have base confidence in Libvirt. And today, that's rarely possible because the upstream testing, if I understand it correctly, is sparse, to put it into those words. 
and um, I've been engaging with the um, with the Libert community to increase to help to ask them to improve their testing, their continuous integration testing, in order in in order to allow us or no, in order to have them deliver something more stable, so that we are feeling better in consuming their software earlier. That is all I wanted to say. So. I want Libra to do more testing so that we are more confident in consuming them. And they seem to be opening up. They had a meeting, uh, had a couple of meetings, and they want to get some people looking up the quality of Libra to upstream of some of the tests so that Libra can also be tested in upstream upon releases. I think that's good news, but we need to see what the timeline of that is. Yep, that's all I wanted to say. Cool. Well, thank you. Any thoughts on that or any thoughts in general before we wrap this up? Great to hear that. That's what I can see. Yep, as well. Side note here, I would really like to say if they live up, live up to that, I would like to continue that we stay rather to something which is moving forward before setting with something that is stable like CentOS. Oh. That's another topic I'll add it to the agenda. In the meantime, are there um, any further thoughts besides what we're doing this currently talking? Then I have a second topic, mm, the last one for me. Um, I think it's nothing which requires immediate action, but we can think about it. So today we base our images on Fedora, and I think that's good. Um, but um, at some point, I mean, we are currently in a very early phase of Kuber. I mean, still very early, or we're moving fast forward, but at some point we really want to make it robust. I think the CI we have, and I can highlight how important CI is for us to provide something stable. But despite having the CI, we want to get to a really stable release in the sense of we want to have a version 1.0, which is yet another topic. But I wondered, are, could, are we confident in the container world of having Fedora as the base OS? Or do we need to consider to have a CentOS-based branch where we, for example, base our, our stable releases on? Because CentOS, yeah. It, I tell so, you why I'm so, so what I, maybe I can add to something here. I, the only reason why we would have that discussion is Libert. So the Libert container or Libert parts run in are the only ones where we are the only ones where we actually care about the content of the base image. For it's not relevant for any other component. Component. It's just go. Um, if it wouldn't kind of double our download bandwidth right now everywhere, I would just say use CentOS for everything else because then we don't have to switch and we don't care about the base anyway. It's not like we miss something of the newest stuff for the other components. Um, yeah, that's just what I wanted to add here, that it's mostly because of the delivered container. So what you're suggesting is if it were possible to ship a recent version of Libvirt, because that's really the challenge, isn't it? Is that because uh, the, the goal with CentOS, or one of the goals is stability, therefore it's not necessarily bleeding edge. If we're consuming uh, the latest features from Libvirt, there's your challenge, is that we would need to ship our own, isn't we? Yeah, and we'll not ship our own build. So we want to ship what others provide us. We want to, con we want to consume binary builds of others. We don't want to build our own. Mm. Yeah, but the woman is right. Liber sorry, the woman is right. It's it's only the liberate image which was relevant. There, there, there was a, last week. There was a discussion that we want to use a OVS uh, for doing the huh. the bridging work instead of the Linux one. I have no idea what implication it has, but it might have different versions on on CentOS and Fedora. Yeah, that's true. Actually, I think it's relevant for. Yeah, for for containers where we use stuff from the base OS, right? Which is not true for the classical infrastructure components like controller, handler, and launcher. 
but for the device plugins, it will become relevant, and also for the um, yeah for liver. Yeah. For every for every component which does not do everything in Go, which by the way, we should prefer. I think um, we have the issue, and I'm not sure if we can control there for the whole product easily at least, or for the whole project easily. Uh, that we have a common base image across different repos even. Uh, it's yeah. probably just not possible. It might not hit us so hard in the core repo, but at least it needs extra effort if we want to synchronize that then later on. Yeah. Yeah, that actually brings me to, now uh, we already stretched the time. I think that's something for next time. Okay, well, that truncated thought. Are there any other topics that we need to discuss? Maybe I can add one more sentence to the last thing. Maybe we should bring to the keyword devil uh, list an email regarding to the base image. We could define something like uh, a base Fedora 28 image with the SHA sum or something so that we can and ask if we want to align on such an image across the whole repos we have in the project, and then, I don't know, bump them on a regular schedule. Or if someone needs something newer, so that we can all say, now we go to the newer one, or something like that, at least. We can, we can, we can introduce a Qbert base image, which is based in Fedora, because then, I mean, that's easier for users to track, you know? I mean, we could ask them to yeah. all use Fedora, yeah. or we can Good just point, yeah. simple image, which is specifying the SHA sum, and then we can, that's a good idea. Yeah. I mean, you know, what I mean is that in the from, we have a simple Docker file. Which yeah, is so we, we would then version that with tags, basically, and we would say use the latest tag. I mean, it's still, uh, might still be a little bit, I'm not entirely sure if we're just, not just adding an extra layer to have the same issues again on top then. So we have to look into details, but might be a solution, yeah. Thanks. Leaving it to use you. Hey, my machine has frozen, so I cannot. I'm not sure. I think Stu's frozen. So then. Let me let me try to end the meeting. Thank you for staying 15 minutes over. Um, that's far too long. Um, was a good update. Thank you very much. Um, and see you in two weeks. Uh, in a week. Bye bye.